Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. The following seminar is brought to you by nonprofit organization iExplore. iExplore is dedicated to providing an extensive online study and communication platform for students throughout the world. We have over 80 teachers and 500 students from multiple countries. Through free online individualized group courses and seminars like this one, iExplore helps students to interact, study, and grow together. I am honored to present um, our seminar presenter today, Ryan Kern, who is also our president of iExplore. He will be guiding us on an ex exploration of one of the most important building blocks of our human body, which is our DNA. So Ryan, the time is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, so my name is Ryan Kern, and I'm currently going into 10th grade at Troy High School. Here's a couple pictures of things I really enjoy doing. I love to play water polo. I enjoy playing the piano. And I'm also really interested in biology, which, I, which is why I'm teaching this series. And in the future, I really want to grow up to be a doctor. Okay, without further ado, let's get into it. Dangerous DNA, learning about the code of life. So really, we're going to try to, throughout this seminar, talk about what DNA is and what it really means for us, not only learning about it, but how it like, affects us, because that, I feel like, is one of the most important parts as well. Because we can learn about something, but if we don't really know what it means for us and what, it can, what we can learn more about ourselves, I really feel like it's not as valuable as like, knowing that information. So we're going to start off with a very nice and easy question for some people is what does DNA stand for? And we're gonna release the poll here pretty soon, but A, D-nucleic acid, B, deoxyribonucleic acid, C, do not age, or D, DNA. It just stands for DNA. So I'm gonna give people a couple minutes here or a couple seconds to go ahead and answer. Yeah, we'll give people just a couple more seconds now. Okay, now I feel like a good number of people have voted. Maybe we can show the results. Okay, so now we're showing the results. As usual, everyone picks the correct answer, which is deoxyribonucleic acid. So why is DNA important? Because it is not only the code of life, but it also holds our genetic information, which I'm gonna talk about later. So DNA has great importance in us because it holds a lot of our information, uh, which I'll have like several analogies to help you guys understand. But just know that it's very important for us and just for everything that we are, like how tall we are, what kind of hair we have, or if we can, just, just many things like eye color, like I talked about. So remember in our last seminar, we talked about how in DNA, eye color is stored in like a gene, and then that DNA becomes a chromosome, which eventually goes into the nucleus. So if you guys don't remember, you can check out our iExplore, let me get my pointer here, iExplore Club YouTube channel for the recording. You just search iExplore Club, and we have also many other videos that you guys can watch. So here are a couple examples of genetic information. This is a trait here that some people have and others don't. It's called a widow's peak. So when you pull back the hair, uh, it's like on your hairline. If there's like a crescent sort of, so like a kind of point, that means you have a widow's peak versus over here, it's flat, so they don't. And that's just one of the traits and that I'll talk about. There's many other examples, but that's stored inside your DNA, inside the genes we we're talking about. So for example, let's say that your father and your mother both had this no widow's peak here. It was very likely you are actually gonna end up without having a widow's peak either because they're gonna pass on their genes to you. Again, another example is this attached earlobe here versus unattached earlobe. If both your parents have unattached earlobes, then you can check yourself right now. You should have unattached earlobes. So it's a very interesting thing because we're talking about DNA, which is inside of our cells, which seem kind of almost irrelevant because they're so small. But in reality, we can see it in a lot of parts of our body already. Another part is your hair, not only your hair color, but also your hair type, as there are many different types of natural hair before like you go to like the salon and like curl it or something. There's many different like types of natural hair that will be passed on as well. 
and height is another factor. If you have two, two like let's say six feet parents, you're not gonna have like a four foot child really, unless there's some sort of disorder or disease going on. Because because of that, they're passing on their genes, which are gonna lead to the next like generation, which is the son or the daughter, and they will have the same the same sort of height. One more example we're gonna talk about is skin tones. This one's a little different because skin tones, although it kind of goes with the height, there are so many different skin tones and there's not just like, there's not just like light and dark and like in between. There's so many different shades as well as heights. There's not just like everyone's six foot or they're five foot. There's so many different heights in between and it's like all over the place, but that's just how these certain traits work and we can explain it in future seminars as to why this trait is different than let's say like the unattached earlobes where there can't really be like an in-between. So we'll talk about that in a future seminar as well. So this is my first analogy here is we can think of DNA as a computer chip. Everyone should know probably that a computer chip stores information using ones and zeros. DNA does the same thing, except it's inside our body obviously. And it also uses these things called nucleotides to store genetic information. So far, does anyone have any questions? Um, Kathy, can you look in the chat or see if there's any questions? Uh, I don't have any right now, but I just opened up the chat. So if you guys have any questions, you can drop it down in the chat section below. Okay, we'll give them a couple seconds here. Mm -hmm. uh, Dorothy has, oh, how to extract DNA? Oh, that's a great question. We're going to get to that later in the, the seminar. So this is why we also have a, a question slide at the very end. So if, in that case, I'm going to move on for now because I feel like at this point, it's so early in the seminar, I might mm -hmm. answer a lot of your questions throughout it. So let's keep going. Right. Here we're going to go over the DNA structure. So if you look here, DNA looks like a twisted ladder, which is called a double helix. All you need to know is that there's four base pairs that make up the rungs, which are the, like the things you climb on for the ladder. And they're adenine, thymine, guanine, and cysteine, or sorry, excuse me, cytosine. But if you see here, they're both paired up with their corresponding ones. So inside the DNA, you will only see this adenine and thymine pairing up. It's never like adenine guanine or adenine cytosine. It's just how it is, and they pair up like that. But again, with the zeros and ones that we were talking about, this is the same thing. Because this order and the different pairings that the like different pairings and the order can store information about us, which is why we look and are who we are today, which is why it's so important. And as we'll get to later in this lecture, mm -hmm. when certain mm -hmm. certain mistakes happen, it causes a lot of yeah, bad effects. Good. Yeah, yeah. So if we look here, this is the uh, twist. Sorry, this is the ladder that we're talking about for the structure of DNA. And we look back, and we see over here we have these like three prime and five prime things. But we notice that the three prime is on the other end, and the three prime is on the other end. So it's not like the same way. What this means is it's called anti-parallel. Usually you have parallel lines. If you were to think about it, let's say like a road that goes the same way, they'll both be going. Oh gosh, okay. They'll both be going this way and they'll be parallel. But anti parallel means that they'll both be going this way. The reason this is anti parallel is because it actually helps the DNA polymerase, which we'll talk about right now. So you don't need to worry about that. But the DNA polymerase can only move in one direction to add nucleotides. Again, we're going to talk about that more throughout the seminar. We can think of it like a highway though, because there's the cars here, they're only going this way. They're not gonna turn around and go back the other way. Same on this side, the cars here are only going this way and they can't turn back on the other side. This is with the sides of the ladder. So we look back here, the sides of the ladder are going in opposite directions. The bases, it doesn't really matter because they're both, they're just in between. They're not on the sides. So that's something to note as well. <laughs> and so here we're gonna talk about the four base pairs. These are the four different combinations, sorry, the four different rungs that we're talking about here. So the adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. 
here we can see that if you see the highlighted parts here, those are the actual bases, and there's something called hydrogen bonds in between them, which are very important in biology, but we're not going to get into it too much today. And there's also the thymine with the adenine correctly paired up. However, we're, we're not going to get in too much here, but I just want you to note one thing. If you look here, this is a type of a sugar, which is why we call it a sugar phosphate backbone. All you need to know is this thing that I'm circling right here, that's the phosphate. This is the sugar. So that's why we call it sugar phosphate. These are the sides of the ladder. So these are the two sides here. And what, where we get the three prime, five prime part is where we actually count. I believe it's starting from here. We go one, two, three, and we get that three prime. We can probably go over the, uh, the chemistry of this and the like biochemical structure a little later, but I just want you to know that what they did is they just counted the, the like carbons, but that was how the molecular like scientists looked at it and decided, oh wait, this one here, we see it's going on this direction, but then this one's like upside down. That's how they came up with the anti-parallel analogy, seeing that both of them went in opposite directions. Now we have another question here. Why do you guys think the four base pairs are actually important? A, they have pieces of ourselves inside of them. B, they just are important. C, they create a wide range of possibilities for genetic variation. Or D, they look really cool. Okay, we'll keep giving people some more time here. Okay, just a couple more seconds now as we, we want to get through our lecture too. Great, so it looks like, once again, you guys are so good. Always picking the correct answer. Yes, the correct answer is C. They create a wide range of possibilities for genetic variation. As I was talking about, the order and the different pairings is actually going to be like the zeros and ones of how of a computer stores information, how our DNA stores our genetic information as well. Great. But how did we get to a ladder from the DNA? Because remember, I was saying, oh, it's double helix. It's like a twisted ladder. But how do you, you can't just really untwist it. How does that happen? Well, we're going to see here that the ladder is actually mainly used to help us see easier the actual nucleotides and the anti-parallel structure because it'd be really hard if you look at the DNA and it's just curving and you're like, how do I know if it's going this way or that way and everything? So it might be a little confusing, but there's another side to it and that's, it also shows a part of DNA replication, which is a big part that we're going to get into here soon. However, before we move on to this bigger part of uh, DNA replication, are there any questions? All right, so I got quite a few questions. One is, are unattached earlobe missing something or gene? Excuse me, could you repeat that? Yeah, um, for unattached earlobes, are they missing something or are they missing a gene? No, it's just like you have two versions of the gene for ears, right? And let's just say one over time has changed a little bit. So what happens is you just have two variations. It doesn't mean that there's something missing. It just means that it's like two variations. And as we'll see later in a future seminar as well, is these genes will actually make like our proteins and that we were talking about with the ribosomes, remember last seminar, and these genes will make those proteins and those proteins will be responsible for the shape of our earlobes, which is how, if you think about it, how the genes actually turn into like the unattached earlobes or the attached earlobe. Because if we think about it, the, the DNA, like we said, was just a sequence of like nucleotides. How does that actually happen and eventually develop into our ears and unattached earlobes? So that's a very cool topic as well. That was a great question. I think we can answer one more too, if there are more. All right, another one I got is that, do the DNA strands curl in a certain direction? Yes, they do. Um, I'm, I'm going to go into that, like, not this lecture, because that's, 
it's a lot more in depth and very specific to the DNA as like it has to deal a lot more with like I was saying the more um, I think it was like chem chemistry in the, the structure of the DNA. So I can definitely go over that and I'll make sure to go over and like a follow up one about DNA that will be definitely more in depth. But right now I wanted to give everyone a good overview so they all have a good idea of DNA before I overwhelm them with like some very uh, intense information. So yeah. Okay. So if anyone else has questions, just please write them down, hold them at the end. We'll have a big chunk of time where we'll be able to answer all the questions. So now DNA replication. This is just how the DNA makes copies of itself because if we have our parents that have their DNA, how are they going to pass it to us? Well, they have to make copies because they can't just give us their DNA. They wouldn't have any. That does, that's not how it works. Here, we see that it just splits in half every time. So after one replication, the one strand becomes two strands, and the two strands become four strands, four strands become eight strands. Now, on the next slide, I have a bunch of numbers of 27 DNA replications of this and what the final result would be of how many different strands there are, okay? I don't want you guys to get too overwhelmed or scared. It's just to show you that DNA is really, really good at replicating, and this is also a very important part because if it wasn't good at replicating, it's going to be a huge problem because we already said how important of a role it plays in our body and that we need to pass on the DNA to our if we have children or our parents need to pass it on to us. So this is 27 DNA replications. And for your sake, I, I put a slide here. So that was eight and a half billion number of DNA strands. However, you look at the DNA replications, 27 doesn't seem like a lot compared to eight and a half billion, which is why, like I was saying, it's really good that it's kind of splitting in half and then making a new one and then splitting in half because this is really successful method and it really helps it because in, as we'll talk about later in each of our cells, there's actually a complete set about like of chromosomes that will have the wound, wound up, excuse me, wound up DNA inside of it. And we're going to talk about a special method that will actually wind up the DNA as well. Yeah. Like I said, this is shows how effective and fast DNA replication is to replicate these DNA strands. So this is how DNA replication actually happens. We're, this is an overview, and then we're gonna go a little more in depth for people that wanna know a little more. Here we have a protein that's gonna help it kind of unwind here. This is why I was saying it's like a ladder, because once it's unwound, it doesn't have the curves anymore. So it's temporarily unwound, so it's flat and straightened out like a ladder, but then as you can see on the left side over here, it rewinds up again. And we have this enzyme here that's called DNA polymerase. This will be the one that will actually be adding on these nucleotides to make the new DNA. And the really interesting thing is, remember how I said the, the A goes with the T, so the adenine with the thymine, and then the guanine, or the G, with the C, which is cytosine. But this is how the DNA actually replicates itself. Because let's say, for example, this one was let's say for example, this one's like cytosine, we all know that it has to be guanine that matches up with it. And if this was adenine, it has to be thymine. So using that, this enzyme can just match them up very easily. And that makes it a lot more efficient so that even if you only have half of the DNA, you can rebuild the other half. So that's why it's very cool and interesting. Here we go more in depth. So I'm gonna point out the main parts of just the whole thing. Here we have a chromosome. It's kind of un like unwound here a little bit to show you the actual DNA here. This is the original parent strand. So that would be like if your parents are trying to pass on their DNA to you. Here we have this helicase. This is also, again, these enzymes and like proteins that are working together to make this actually happen. It's all, almost like the factory analogy we use, except this time it's like, it's like actually working on it instead of being inside of like a ribosome. It's just out in the field, I guess you could say, and it's just working on it there. We have our two DNA polymerases. And if you notice, there's something called lagging strand and leading strand. 
what is happening is because we said the anti-parallel like nature of the DNA, it's actually very important because we said that these DNA polymerase, the enzyme, they can go only one way, right? So I'm going to have an analogy here to help everyone understand, but I'm going to just talk about it right now. It's like if you're building a road, you kind of need to have something underneath before you just build like new roads. So let's say they're trying to repair like the asphalt. They need to have something to build off of. That's just like this where you can't see it right now, but in the, I believe this is the video that I'm going to show later, you'll be able to see they put down something called a primer. And again, you can also think about it like a paint. Like if you want to paint a wall, you need to put down a primer before you actually paint it. So just like that, and then they can use that, these DNA polymerase, the enzymes, they can use that and just add on. And they can only go in one direction, remember? So what happens is they can only go from, okay, it's all the way back there, so I'm not going to go back. They can only go from the, from the five prime end to the three prime end. So this is why you see them going in opposite directions because it's anti-parallel. So the different sides are different. And then so it's going in opposite directions. The lagging strand though is different because what's happening is, I have a great video to summarize this. So if you're lost right now, uh, well, that video will be a great summary. This thing is unwinding like constantly. You can think of it like almost almost like a machine. It's just constantly unwinding. And these things are like constantly just building it, building it, building it, building it. And it actually goes really fast because there's a lot of DNA for it to replicate. But this lagging strand, it has a primer here and then it goes this way. But then once all this new stuff comes out, it needs to put the primer back here and then go this way again. So by doing that, it's let's say like we put the primer right here and then we we put the DNA, like, or sorry, the yeah, DNA polymerase, and then it starts building, building, building. But then eventually, the rope kind of like the the strand of DNA kind of moves over. So then we need to make another primer here, and then this causes what are called Okazaki fragments. You don't need to memorize it. Just know that it creates these little pieces that they may be right next to each other, but they're not connected. Unlike the top one, where it just keeps adding and just adding. So. If you're confused right now, it's okay. I'm gonna go over some more of it and we have a nice video to summarize it. Like I was saying, we need to have the primer to actually build onto, um, to actually add on to the DNA. Just like for a road, we need something actually underneath it before we can build the road. You can't just build the road on air, you know? So we kind of need that. That's just a great analogy. Or like I was saying with the paint one that I just thought of now, you can put down the primer first, then you paint it. Here's the DNA replication video I was talking about. This one I think is really good. It has nice 3D animations and I'm going to be talking throughout the video to help you guys as well. Okay. So let me just set it up really quick here. Um, yeah, let me put the, I'm going to speed it up just a little bit. Okay, here we have the DNA strand. It's gonna be unwound. They're pointing out the different base, uh, the different, sorry, nucleotides we were talking about, A with T and then G with C, just like that. And they're just highlighting them to show you that. The five prime, remember, the three prime end. And then again, this is the anti-parallel. This is going to be our helicase. This is the one that splits it open. Here we have the two strands, remember? We're gonna just focus on one of them. This is the primase here, so let me, let me pause it a little bit. So the primase, what it does is it just puts the primer down. That's its only job. Oh, whoops, I need to go back. Okay, let me, let me speed it up. Give me one second here. Okay. Um, oh gosh, it's kind of rough here. Okay. Okay. So yeah, if you guys didn't get that the first time, we're going over it again. 
And here we're having a split open, right? Helicase, and then let me slow it down just a little bit now. Okay, great. So here we're gonna have our primase, put down the primer. Then we have the DNA polymerase gonna come in anytime here. And it's gonna start attaching these nucleotides. And then it's just gonna make the corresponding ones like we talked about. However, we said this one, it can just keep going in this direction and there's no problem with it. So it will have no problem just like as it's being unwound, it just keeps going and keep going. But here, this right here is the primer and here are the nucleotides. And you see it's actually not connected right here. So that's a problem and it's called Okazaki fragments. So we have a special kind of, um, here's a primer again, and they're gonna show the DNA polymerase. We also have another protein here or enzyme that is actually going to fix this and it will end up replacing this primer here because the primer is not actually DNA, the nucleotides, and it'll replace the primer and then also put these two together so there's not a gap. Yeah, see this one's taking out this primer and then DNA polymerase goes back, fixes it. Then we have one last one, the ligase, it just puts it together. So that's a very in-depth overview of DNA replication. So, yep, that's how it is. Does anyone have questions now? Because now I felt uh, that everyone should have a good understanding of the DNA replication. And if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, we got a bunch of questions in the chat section. So nice. one thing was that, are human DNA and animal DNA the same? Sorry, was the question, are the animal and human DNA the same? Yes. So this is a big topic that I'm gonna get into in my uh, like evolution lecture as well, because I know people have been very interested in that. But there, okay, so there's different parts of it. The DNA, remember the DNA is not only for us. It's not just humans that have DNA. Many other organisms have DNA, including animals. But what makes us different is, again, the sequence of DNA. So the sequence of DNA is what separates us. And again, those genes that are inside the DNA is what makes us into the actual people, the actual flesh, like bone that we are. So if you have different sequences and different like lengths or sizes or whatever that holds the information, you're going to have different things like different animals, different plants, all sorts of stuff. So that's really what is affecting. Yeah, that's so our, and sorry, to recap, the DNA is the same, but it just has the different like segments and stuff. So the nucleotides is the same, the anti-parallel same, but the order and sequence is different, which is why the animals are not humans and the humans are not animals. I hope that clarified. Yep, that was a great answer. Another question we got was that, where do the helicases come from? Great question as well. So we said that the ribosomes are the ones making these proteins. So the proteins we said were like robots in the last lecture, last seminar, and they go do a bunch of work. So it's either gonna be like these ribosomes that are making it, or there's many other cellular uh, organelles that are like working. And what's gonna happen is we said the cytoplasm, the very interesting thing is with the cytoplasm, there's gonna be a lot of free floating sort of like proteins and like things just floating around trying to do their job. So that's where these are gonna end up coming from. And yeah. Oh, also another interesting fact is that DNA will actually not ever leave the nucleus. I think that's something I forgot to mention last lecture. So the DNA is always inside the nucleus. That's just how it is. So what happens is like, it wants to replicate, right? But then it will have to open, unwind inside the nucleus, replicate, and then it will just like put it into the chromosomes, which can then like separate and then go into the different ones. But the raw DNA that's in the strand form before it like condenses, that's not gonna end up leaving the nucleus. Okay, I think we can do one more question. Um, actually, I got a few questions as 
Um, one of the most common questions was, what is RNA? Okay, RNA, um, actually, okay, can we, can we save this question for later? Because this one, like, I'll answer at the end of this uh, seminar, just remind me. But this one has, like, a little bit more in-depth as to how it's different. Because I'll just tell you guys now that RNA is only, like, single-stranded. And really, it's more like if we say the DNA is like the language of, we just pretend it's the language of life, the code of life. Well, RNA is kind of like the language of like proteins, and they use it a lot. Um, yeah, just remind me at the end of the seminar, and I'll, I'll go over it too at the end where we have the questions portion. But I have some really interesting material that I want to get through first. So we talked about this a little bit here, but like the DNA, right? Because we talked about how it's going to somehow like transform into these chromosomes. But the question is like, how does it actually do that? Well, let's see what you guys think here. We have another question. How does DNA go from the double helix to a chromosome? A, it goes through an interesting process called supercoiling. B, it unravels and forms a ball, which eventually becomes a chromosome. C it tries to tie a knot and gets tangled really bad. Yeah, we'll give everyone, uh, give them still a couple seconds here, keep going. Looks like this one's a little, a little more divided than usual, so that's good. Nice to see an interesting change. Okay, everyone's gonna have like five more seconds here to vote. Okay, I think we can post the results now. Yeah, great job. So everyone picked the correct answer, well, majority of people, excuse me, is that it goes through an interesting process called supercoiling. It actually does not unravel. In fact, it goes like, supercoiling is really the opposite of that and then that's how it becomes a chromosome. So let's move on here. Correct answer, A, great job. Rope time, this is how we're gonna try to describe DNA supercoiling to everyone. And this is, yeah, hopefully everyone will get it. And if you guys have any questions, just ask me at the end. Here, I know it's kind of blurry, but we have this DNA double helix. And we have these things called histones. I'm gonna talk about them later in the seminar. All you need to know just remember, they're proteins, that's it, okay? And they're gonna actually bind to the DNA and they're really important for this kind of super coiling process. And so they keep winding and winding and winding and then eventually it just super coils and you get a chromosome. How does that happen? We can use rope to kind of analyze this here. So let's say we have a piece of rope or maybe a string that's pretty easy. If you just hold one end and just keep twisting it and twisting and twisting it, and then you know how you push it together, it forms like a loop. That's sort of what's happening here because the DNA is trying to twist and twist and twist. It forms these loops, or yeah, it forms these like loops, and then these loops can form more loops, which is how it super, super condenses, and that way it can fit inside the cell. However, we have to note one thing. DNA is not just like one piece of string, really. It's actually kind of connected. So this is a good analogy for the rope to help us understand the two different kinds of coils it can make. But in reality, it's like one big circle. So it's gonna, it's, as it twists, it's gonna form more and more, um, more and more like coils. And this will help it super coil until it becomes the chromosome. We're gonna talk over histones, what they are, and why are they even important. Here we have the DNA. Here the histones are actually going to be wrapped by the DNA and it'll hold it and the, the whole unit with a histone wrapped around DNA, just called the nucleosome, that's all you need to know. So that's just like one unit here that we use for the histones being wrapped in DNA. As you can see, this will eventually all come together to form a chromatin here. They form more loops, more condensed loops, and eventually a chromosome. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, I did get a few questions. So one question I got is that, why do the nucleotides pair up like it does? 
That's a very good, uh, very good question here. Um, I'll make sure to write it down, but it, it, it really like requires, again, a very in-depth, more chemistry heavy perspective explanation that really goes into the structure of DNA a lot more. So I'll make sure to answer that in my next seminar because right now I don't want to get into too much as I just wanted like to give everyone an overview so people that don't really know what DNA is have a better understanding. But I really see that there's a lot of interest in the more structural parts of DNA and really how they interact with each other, which I'll, I'll definitely have a seminar on too. Do we have another question? Yep. We, um, one question is that, can we extract DNA from fossils? Yes, we can. And we are going to, I'm going to show you a method to extract DNA that you can actually do in your own house. So it's going to be pretty cool. Okay, we can do one more question. All right, one more question is that, can only living things have DNA? Do non-living things have DNA? No. So non-living things do not have DNA. Um, sometimes you have like viruses, but like viruses, they, they don't really, they don't use DNA. Only living things have DNA. For a lot of other things that are like non-living or they're just like, let's say for example, the proteins and stuff, they have RNA and they use RNA. So you can think of like DNA as maybe the elite like class of information holding and RNA is kind of like the lower classes, as you can see, because all the other organisms that actually use RNA to store their genetic information, there's a lot of problems with that and using that and just trying to have that like work for them. And that's why viruses actually infect us because we have the DNA, which they can kind of insert their own genes into, which is how the cell becomes kind of like taken over, like hijacked, and then it starts making more viruses. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to move on here. Now that we all have a good understanding of DNA, we're going to answer a very interesting question here. Is like, why did I choose dangerous DNA for the seminar? So far, we talked about DNA. Everything's okay, right? It's, so why is it dangerous? There's something called mutations. I kind of hinted at this a little bit in the very beginning when I was talking about how what happens if it makes a mistake and it can have really big impacts. We're going to just see one example of this, and it has very serious like implications. This is sickle cell anemia. There's a lot on this slide, so I'm going to spend a good amount of time here kind of going over what happens. Sometimes these DNA polymerases make a mistake, or there's just a mistake somewhere in the line, because you have to realize that when a cell divides, it, it, it has to have all of its DNA all the chromosomes already copied. So these, these DNA polymerases are working like really, really fast. And they're like the DNA is zipping through, zipping through, zipping through, and it's trying to like make it really fast. It's very precise. However, out of all of our cells, because again, we have trillions of cells, remember? Out of all of our cells, it's, it's likely there's just, even though there's such a small percentage and possibility that there's actual mistake, it's, it's kind of, magnified by the fact that we have so many cells and that this is happening in all the cells. This is literally one nucleotide mistake, one change. As you can see here, it was supposed to be an A to a T versus it became the T to the A. This will affect the RNA, which we'll talk more about like gene expression, which is what I was saying, how the gene becomes like our earlobe. This causes it to have a different protein here and this causes it to become a mutation one this is happening in some people's red blood cells right now and what happens is because this one change causes there to be a different protein made this causes this the red blood cell is supposed to be nice and circular like this we can see here it's nice and circular and if we cut it in half theoretically you can see there's this thing called hemoglobin. This is really important for carrying oxygen because our whole body needs oxygen. And what happens is when we breathe in oxygen from the atmosphere, it goes into our lungs. The lungs have these little sacs called alveoli where the, the oxygen will actually meet the blood and it will just diffuse across 
because what happens is there's such a there's such a small like kind of like almost gap you could say but it's kind of like the cell to cell interactions which is why the the gases can just diffuse through anyway what happens is when you have abnormal hemoglobin this causes the really like sickle weird shape of the red blood cells as we can see here this looks like almost like a hot dog and is really bad because one it doesn't have as much hemoglobin. You look here, these red blood cells look huge compared to here. They have so much more like area on the surface and they can have more oxygen. So it's really good like that, right? So then they, first of all, the sickle cells cannot carry that much oxygen. Second of all, we look here, and this is pretend this is like one of our veins or arteries. We see that, okay, all the red blood cells, they can fit and we have a lot of the sickle cells. The sickle cells do their shape they're gonna actually, they can very frequently block blood flow, which is super dangerous. Because if it happens in your heart, that's how people have heart attacks because then the blood is cut off. So it's very dangerous. People with sickle cell anemia will actually have, they have, it's very dangerous for them to exercise because like we said, they can't really get the oxygen that they need. So it's very dangerous for them. And they, they just have to really, be careful and have like monitor like their visits with their doctors and everything because it's a very serious disease. However, it's very interesting too because this is a mutation, but not all mutations are necessarily bad. This one is bad, but there's a flip side to it. In places where there's a lot of ma malaria, which is like a mosquito biting in and then it transmits a really bad disease and it's really, really prevalent in some of the more impoverished countries, sickle cell anemia will actually, or just having like sickle cell, excuse me, having half of the sickle cell uh, gene, which we'll talk about later in like kind of the gene expression, like I was saying, having half of it where you won't die from not having enough oxygen, but you have like kind of, you're kind of in between. You're not gonna die if you exercise too much, really or you just exercise in general and then like you might have like the block flow to your heart but you're kind of more risky than the normal person exercising and you you have some issues but not all of them that we're talking about here anyway this brings me to my point that the sickle cell will actually help people survive and provide them kind of almost this immunity to malaria which is why that places with malaria sickle cell anemia just the the half of it though is very prevalent, which is very interesting because when you think about it, you're like, oh, this mutation is bad. No one should have it because if they have it, they might end up dying and then they can't pass it on. So that's just very interesting of how the DNA can directly affect our lives and how also there's a flip side. Sometimes it's not always bad. Now we've been talking about DNA for a long time in this lecture, right? We've been talking about structure. We've been talking about replicating, and a lot of other stuff too. But what does it actually look like in real life? This is why I'm gonna go over here. Here is a microscope picture of the DNA. This is already coiled, so it's kind of hard to see a little bit because it's like the, the image is just hard with the microscope. But we can see this is actual DNA here. You can see it. It kind of has this really weird consistency and like texture and stuff but we're gonna talk more about like banana DNA specifically. We're gonna, you guys are gonna learn how to do a banana DNA experiment at your own home. By the end of this, you will be able to see and feel and touch and like mess around with and see the actual DNA from the banana cells. First, we're gonna take our bananas and we're gonna cut them into pretty small pieces. You want them to be pretty small because remember, the cells have the DNA. Second, we're going to put it into a blender with a teaspoon of salt and a little bit of warm water, and we're going to blend it for five to 10 seconds. We don't want to be like super thick, but we don't want to be like too runny, so kind of in between. We're going to pour it into a strainer. I would say like a coffee filter because that will strain out all the like banana part, and then only the, only the like liquid will really go through. Here, you're going to add two teaspoons of liquid soap. So it can be like, you know, dish soap or anything like that. 
but you want to stir very softly. You do not want bubbles. Don't like try to make a bubble bath in there. Don't do that. Stir it very softly, okay? And what we're gonna do is let's say we have our cup here, right? And inside I've already done all the steps one through five. I'm going to tilt the cup and have my rubbing alcohol and pour it in very slowly. And not like this, not all the way, but just very slowly so that a little bit trickles down. And you're gonna wait probably five to 10 minutes or so. And you wanna just make sure you pour in like rubbing alcohol, keep pouring it in, and then you wait. And then what happen is it'll actually begin to separate and you can see the DNA. Here I have, right here in my own room, I have some example banana DNA I collected from doing this experiment as well. It's kind of hard to see maybe in front of the camera. I'm gonna see if you can see it or not, but it, it, it looks a lot like liquid, but it has like, if you can see it's very, it's not clear really. It's, it's kind of like opaque, which just means like not clear all the way and it has a little cloudiness inside. So yeah. And then once you guys do this experiment, you'll be able to have like your own little capsule there. Now we're gonna have a couple fun questions here. How long is the DNA of one of your cells? A, 0 0.5 meters, B, one meter, C, two meters, or D, 300 meters. Keep in mind that like we said that it really super, super coils a lot to compress into the actual cells. And so we're talking about if we took the DNA out and we stretched it all the way out, like, so it's single stranded, okay? Also keep in mind the size of the cell as well, because the cells themselves are very small. We'll give people a couple more seconds here. Okay, maybe like, okay, there we go. So it's very interesting. People thought 300 meters. However, if you, if you know in reality what 300 meters looks like, it's a very, very long distance. So that's actually not the correct answer this time. The correct answer is actually two meters, which is still a long amount for just one cell. Remember, one cell, that's a lot. But now that we know how much DNA is in one of your cells, hint, remember we have like trillions of cells. How many do you think the DNA is in all of your cells? How long is it? Here we have one million. Here, this is 100 billion. Here we have like 2 billion, all, all of this here. Or we just have twice the distance around the solar system. These results should be definitely very interesting. Well, it looks like right now people are kind of debating between C and D. Okay, we'll give everyone a couple more seconds, so make sure you guys vote. Okay, I think we can close the polling now. Wow, so you guys got the correct answer. It's twice the distance around our solar system. Again, two meters, and then we have trillions of, tr trillions of cells, which just means that it's gonna be a huge distance. So great job, thank you guys for all answering. Now we're gonna have a quick review quiz, okay? I also have a poll for this. What is this picture here? Is it DNA? Is it noodles? Or is it candy wrapper? Or is it a very nice painting? We're not gonna spend too much time on this one because it hopefully should be pretty similar, pretty simple by this point. Yep, great job, great job, DNA. Okay, this one is a little bit harder. What is one of the four base pairs in DNA? I love biology ion, adenine, cysteine, thionine. People are torn between B and C. Okay.
Okay, just a little bit longer now, and then we're going to close the polling. So put in your last couple votes here. And I think, wow, dang, that was like a 50-50 split almost in half. 39% adenine, 40% cysteine. So the correct answer was adenine. If you remember, I accidentally said cysteine, but in reality, I corrected myself, and on all the slides, they said cytosine. So I put cysteine because I know it sounds very similar. So great job to everyone. Lastly, what protein is used for supercoiling? Superstones, banana protein, histones, or coil stones? Okay, I think we can close the polling here because um, I want to get through the end here and then answer some of your guys' questions, which I look forward to. Great job. Everyone did a great job. Okay, histones. I wanted to thank everyone for coming to the seminar. So right now we're going to be answering questions. So thank you guys. And if you guys want to see more in the future, you guys can always let us know like what subjects you're more interested in. I definitely will note the more like detailed chemistry structure of DNA and I'll make sure to go over that as well. And also make sure to check out our iExplore YouTube channel because we'll be posting the recording and you can tell your friends or if they couldn't make it to the seminar. Okay, let me stop sharing so I can pull up the whiteboard and answer questions. All right, first of all, I just wanna say that we got a bunch of questions. So thank you so much for your enthusiasm. And because of that, we do have a limited time frame and we won't be able to get to all of them. So just uh, keep your questions in mind for next time. So first, first of all, how does sickle cell anemia happen? So specifically, how does the nucleotides get messed up? So what happens is really, again, like I said, it's just the placement because what happens is just the placement just like errors just so slightly just errors just because it's under a lot of strain trying to go really fast and then make all those the nucleotide correct that sometimes it just grabs the wrong one puts it in and it has to keep going however we will talk about a little more as that happens right but there's also other proteins which are very amazing as well they'll actually go into the dna and fix those errors but then again the small super small chance is that those proteins will miss that error as they're going through and checking and trying to get through the DNA pretty fast. So what really just happens is the first one makes a mistake and then the follow-up proteins miss it as well. So that's how the error gets passed through. And then what can often happen is really once that, that, that change is in there, uh, okay. Once that change is in there, what will actually, ha actually happen is it can be passed on, which is kind of bad because that means you can pass on this horrible sickle cell anemia to other people. Great question. All right. Another one we got is that where do nucle nucleotides come from? Great question. Also, in the cytoplasm, if you look inside, or actually I believe, sorry, it was in the nucleus. It was where the, the replication is occurring. If you looked in the video, it was just grabbing it from the surrounding solutions. So that's actually what happens is there's a lot of nucleotides inside the nucleus that are free floating and they're waiting for when the DNA replicates that they can be pulled in using the proteins. All right, another one we got from quite a while ago is that are attached ear lobes and recessive trait. That one I, I will talk about later because it, well, obviously we have so many people on the earth that have both attached and recess, uh, sorry, attached and unattached earlobes, but that's also a great topic for a different seminar where we're going to go over like genetics and heredity, which is really just how you inherit things. And we see that certain genes will actually overpower other ones. For example, let's say like these flowers that this person, the scientist named Gregor Mendel, he used these pea plants and the flowers, and he really, it was really fascinating because he got the basics of genetics just from using those and breeding them. 
But anyway, let's say we have purple, which is a dominant flower color, and then we have white, which is recessive. When you mix them together, and then the the um sorry, the purple will actually end up covering the white. So you just have a purple, and then you're like, what happened to the white? So that's one of the examples of dominant gene and dominant alleles versus recessive ones. So we can talk about that more when I when I focus on that. All right, so another question we got is that what is a speed of DNA replication? What is a, excuse the, me, what? Of the DNA? speed of DNA replication. How fast does it go? Yeah, so the, the speed of DNA replication, again, I'm gonna, I'll probably add this for the next seminar where I go more in depth about the specifics of everything. But the speed is very fast because we think about we think about the whole cell like dividing and everything is like a very very it, it's a relatively long slash like kind of short depending on how you think about it it can be like there's a range again depending on the different cell types it can be like around an hour or longer or shorter but if we think about it the the DNA has to be able to replicate very fast because we each have a lot of chromosomes. And again, we'll, we'll discover, sorry, we'll talk about this more when we get into heredity where it deals with the chromosomes and disorders with those chromosomes. So I think that that might be the idea for next seminar as well, because I see there's a lot of interest in that and I can add in probably some of the, the chemistry of the DNA as well. All right, They're great you. questions. Yeah, and then, uh, um, oh, here's a question. Do red blood cells have a nucleus? No, so remember, they're actually very specialized kind of cells. I said generally all cells try to have these basic like organelles and everything, but super specialized cells like red blood cells, you actually see them, they, they really don't because their main job, like we said, carry the hemoglobin, move around the body, distribute the oxygen. That's it. And so they, for them, there's, there's no reason for them to really have the nucleus. They're just going to move in the bloodstream and they'll just move around the body and then keep going and like circulating. So again, that's not, we're talking about like when we look at these, the cells in the past seminar that we did, we're talking about like the generalized, the generalized cells that have like these organelles. But again, we talked, we said how there's very specific ones that don't necessarily follow these rules. All right, thank you for that question. And here's a question, uh, how does cancer happen? Great question. So cancer is also due to uh, like mutations because what, what we said is that over time, it's, it's more likely that there's gonna be a mutation because they're going super fast, they're trying to get through the DNA, they're really accurate, but we have so many cells that are constantly dividing that eventually it makes a mistake. This is why as you get older, it is usually more likely that you're going to have cancer because as your cells go through more and more replications, eventually there's going to be enough mistakes or the specific mistake to lead to cancer. However, there's actually a different way to go to cancer is if you have enough UV exposure or radiation. So there's a lot of like talk about skin cancer and how that happens is really from the sun being like shining the UV light on us and exposed, long exposed periods of time that you're in the sun can really, without sunscreen as well, can really impact your skin and cause it because the UV light is so powerful, it can actually break some of the bonds because we talked about the hydrogen bonds, right? You can actually break those in the DNA this can eventually, after so many of these bonds have been broken, but maybe the right one will be broken for it to lead to cancer. Yeah. Um, I think those are all the questions that I logged down. And, oh, here's a new one. What happens if you die? What will happen to your DNA? So we said like before how the fossils, we can extract some of the DNA from them. The DNA is going to still be there, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be in a very different form than our just normal living cells. Because everything's kind of dying and decomposing, even on the cellular level and biochemical and chemistry level, things are starting to break down. So that's why, like, you know, in Jurassic Park, they just take 
they take the DNA from the, the like the the dinosaur fossil and they just make dinosaurs. But really, people can't scientists can't do that unless they have a perfect set of DNA, which is really extremely hard to come by because. Think about the dinosaurs have been like underground for so long and their DNA has just been like slowly kind of corroding. If you can think about it like that, as it breaks down more and more till there's barely any segments that we can really use and analyze. All right. Thank you for that answer. So I see a few raising their hands and I'm going to unmute them so they can just ask it uh, straight ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. So Dorothy, I just unmuted you. Uh, so, what if all your DNA just disappeared? So, the thing is, like, the DNA is going to be, like, coiled up inside the nucleus. So, it's not going to really just disappear like that, as it's very protected, and we said it never leaves the nucleus. However, if it were to disappear, what would happen is, like, all your cells would not be able to like divide and you would most certainly like uh, die just because again, it has so much information. It's almost like the nucleus is like your brain sort of. And if it controls the rest of the cell, you just delete your brain, then you don't have the rest of your body really and you can't use it anymore. So then you would die as well. Um, so you said that the sickle cell anemia happens because some of the red blood cell genes uh, have an error, so, but red blood cells don't have a nucleus to hold the, the DNA, how does, and so if there's no DNA in it, how does it become an error? Yeah, that's a great question, but remember, we have to have something that's like making these red blood cells as well, and like, they, they may have some sort of, like, some sort of, let's say, like, place where they have their, their genetic information, but we can have we can have these things called like stem cells where they are not really specified yet so those things will have like a dna and nucleus and they can divide and eventually they can become red blood cells or they can become bone cells they can become a lot of things so really that's why it's that's why we still have red blood cells because if they didn't have dna to really like pass down and then like replicate then it'd be very hard for us to still be alive that was a great question. Uh, why is it chemically impossible for DNA to pair up wrong? Like an A pairing up with a G or a C? Okay, so I'm going to, like, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can show you. Uh, let me stop share here so I can go back to the slides. Let me find them real quick. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Let me share my screen. You guys really have great questions today. I'm really excited. Okay, so let me escape here. Go back, I think. Let me try to find the slide really quick. Yeah, so right here. We look at here as, again, we have to talk more about the chemical, like chemistry nature of this. But we see that there's two bonds here and there's three bonds here. What's going to happen is you can't have, like, let's say these three are all supposed to be bonded to these three. You can't have this just pop in here and try to bond here because this bottom one still wants to form a bond, right? But it just straight up cannot happen here, which is why that, like, these, these like, the, the mutations are not going to switch, really. The, like, guanine and, like, match up to thy thymine is really just going to switch like the order or like something like that because again chemically it's very very like very difficult almost impossible it might occur if something crazy happens but it, just with the structure and how these these like atoms are attracted to each other it just does not it's like not compatible like you have two different like let's say you have two different keys for two different locks you try to switch the keys and unlock the locks it's not going to work like that so it's kind of like that. You can think of it like that. All right. So again, we are we are on a limited time frame, so we can't get to all of your questions. But again, thank you so much for asking them. They are very interesting questions, and they are very good questions that give very educational answers. So thank you so much for that. 
And so I think we will have to close soon because of our time and a lot of it's kind of late for some people on yeah. different time zones. And um, if you have any more questions, make sure to contact iExplore and uh, contact them to ask any questions you have and they will direct you to Ryan to answer your questions. So yeah, scan this QR code right here if you have any questions. And um, I do apologize again that we can't get to every single question. But again, thank you so much for coming here with me. And um, so Emily, if you can just close it up for us. Um, yeah, so thank you so much to Ryan for presenting us with such an extensive seminar with all those really everyday examples and with that really interesting little experiment at the end. So um, I'm sure everyone managed to take something away from this. Um, I surely hope you all did. Well, I know I kind of did. So again, if you have any questions, make sure to contact us um, and we will be sure to get to you. Um, so this is it, guys. Um, thank you once again. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in our next seminar. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.